Secretary of State Anthony Blinken continued to defend the administration's handling of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, yesterday appearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. President Biden has described the evacuation from Afghanistan as an extraordinary success. His words, extraordinary success. This has to be the lie of the 21st century. It's dishonest, and if he believes it, it's delusional. I think it's a moral disgrace. You nearly dislocated your shoulder, though, patting yourself on the back for the great job you've done. We had a government and security forces in place uh, that, by every uh, estimate, uh, would be able to protect the city, protect Kabul, uh, protect the other provincial capitals, uh, certainly through the year. There were uh, people who managed to flood the airport. Uh, we had to do an uh, immediate assessment of those. We had to make sure we could clear people out of the airport so that the flights could come in, go out. But no one uh, came to the United States uh, without being checked somewhere else first to make sure that they don't pose a security threat. You knew that, that there was no way you were going to get all these people out in time. Let me put a final uh, point on a, on a rap, on a, uh, given, given the rapid collapse of the Afghan security forces. And, 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 and you said yesterday that you inherited a, a, a date uh, but, in fact, you didn't inherit the date. Uh, the date was May 1st, and you pushed it to August 31st. I don't understand why, mm -hmm. why a date was actually not inherited and a date was not selected that would be sufficient to actually remove people from the nation. We took some risk uh, in terms of what the Taliban would do or not do after May 1st in pushing uh, beyond May 1st. And we, of course, uh, worked this very hard. because well, it's, the, a no, it's a risk with other people we took. It's a risk. The, the risk was on people we care for. Yeah. Um, well, it's also doing what 75 percent of the American people had been asking politicians to do for a very long time. Uh, I may have been in that 25 percent, uh, but he was following the popular. I just got to say one other thing, too. Um, a comment was made to Secretary of State Blinken that uh, that it was a lie of the century uh, to suggest that uh, this evacuation uh, where Basically, uh, 120, 130,000 people about the size of Billings, Montana, uh, have been airlifted to safety away from Afghanistan. That it was a lie of the century to say that that was a su success. Um, <clears throat> even if you disagree that it was a success, I think we can all, all agree that the political lie of the century that unfortunately too many Republicans continue to support is that the 2020 election was rigged. And the democracy, right. American democracy, uh, has failed, and and that Joe Biden is not the rightful president of the United States. That's so. Let's just get that straight. If you're talking about the lie of the century, that's the lie of the century. Uh, anything else coming out of any other Republican's mouth really is laughable. Yeah, Let's bring in right now difficult. Democratic Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut. He sits on the Foreign Relations Committee, and was there yesterday. And joins us now. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Senator Mika has a question. Senator, just how overall, how did Anthony Blinken, how did the Secretary of State do making the case for the way the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan? I think Secretary Blinken acquitted himself very well yesterday. Um, listen, this is a big moment for Republicans like Senator Brasso. Um, these are legislators that cheerled this war for 20 years, um, that forced us to stay there arguably 10 years too long after we knew that the uh, Taliban was likely going to overrun the government and the military, that we had been there training. And so, you know, their effort here is to try to obscure uh, what was bad decision making by uh, cheerleaders of the war for 20 years by focusing all of the nation's attention on what happened over the last uh, 30 days. Um, now, of course, uh, I think even Secretary Blinken would say he would do some things differently. But the idea that the United States has the power, with only a couple thousand troops and diplomats inside Afghanistan, um, to prevent pandemonium and chaos on the streets after the overnight collapse of the Afghan military and government um, is magical thinking. Um, uh, getting 130,000 people 
people out is impressive. Um, but there was no way to stop a mad rush to the airport. There was no way for the United States to be able to control the streets of Kabul to get everybody easily and safely to the airport. When wars end, they unfortunately are very messy. And I don't know that we've ever had um, a airlift of human beings that brought this many people in this short amount of time uh, out of a war zone into safety. So there's still a lot of work to do. I think there still is an accounting that has to be done of whether we could have done things better here. But I think Blinken is right that um, those people on the ground serving the United States, diplomats and soldiers should be applauded for the work that they did to get so many people out of harm's way. Senator Murphy, good morning. It's Willie Geist, your fellow Connecticut senator and friend Richard Blumenthal said this yesterday. He said we are tainting America's reputation around the world by abandoning essential honor and moral imperative by failing to do more to evacuate American citizens and Afghan allies. On that piece of it, can the Biden administration be doing more? Should it have done more in the weeks and months leading up to the deadline to get Afghan wartime allies out to whom we made a promise? Fight alongside us against the Taliban, fight alongside us against Al Qaeda, and we will make sure you're safe. I think the Biden administration is making an extraordinary effort. Uh, and I think you have to rewind a bit to understand how difficult it was to get out all of the Afghan partners that we would have liked. Uh, President Trump effectively shut down what we call the SIV program. This is the program by which we bring out interpreters, uh, drivers, security professionals that were embedded with the U.S. military. Uh, Trump stopped interviews of those individuals, uh, dramatically slowed the flow of Afghan partners partners out of the country. And so Joe Biden had to sort of effectively restart it from scratch. I, listen, I think we are all heartbroken by the fact that we weren't able to get out every single Afghan partner uh, that worked with us. Um, but we did save 100,000 lives. We are going to continue to try to work to get more uh, out of the country. Uh, and I think there is, unfortunately, just simply a limit to what only a couple thousand troops can do inside Afghanistan. That's the number that Donald Trump left there when Joe Biden came into office. So a lot more work to do. Um, but I'm I'm proud of the effort that our soldiers and diplomats did to get so many out of there in a short period of time. Senator, you've been to Afghanistan. You know the history of the country. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was speaking to someone who you know, who was intimately involved with the policies surrounding Afghanistan for several years. And that's this person told me, quote, it was always going to end this way, unquote. Do you agree with that assessment, his backward look at the picture of what happened uh, at the airport in those, uh, you know, 10, 12 days? What was stunning to me about my visits to Afghanistan uh, starting about 10 years ago was this contrast between the assessment of the intelligence analysts and the assessments of the Department of Defense personnel. The intelligence analysts told visiting delegations routinely that once the United States left, the Taliban would run the country, that there was no way for us to stand up an American-style democracy, an American-style military. But the generals on the ground, um, in part because they just always sort of come to their job with a can-do spirit, um, had a different view. They believed that they could continue to adjust the plan such that they would be successful in being able to stand up a Afghan uh, political and military infrastructure that could permanently withstand the Taliban. Um, it, it turned out that the intelligence analysts were right, uh, and we never solved this conflict that existed between those two entities. To me, that's what's heartbreaking, the fact that we stayed there for 10 extra years, that we lost hundreds of additional American lives, that we spent an additional trillion dollars of our taxpayer money um, once it should have been clear to policymakers that the task we were given there was unachievable. And that's the accounting that I think Congress should be doing right now, not just about what happened in the last 40 days, but what happened over the last 10 years that caused us to stay uh, in a mission that was uh, likely unachievable. Hey, Chris, Claire here. Let me uh, change gears just for a minute. Um, our friend Joe Manchin uh, clearly is enjoying all the attention. Like all United States senators, he enjoys all the attention he's getting. But I'm getting phone calls, and I'm talking to uh, many of your colleagues in the Senate on the Democratic side that have mounting frustration because Joe is not saying what he's against specifically 
and what he's for specifically in the bill that is still hanging in the balance, and that is the Biden bill to radically change some of the programs that help the exact families that really need it right now. So am I correct that Manchin needs to finally say what he's for and what he's against and quit just doing these vague deals, I'm not for it? Or, and if I'm putting you on the spot, I apologize, but I'm really not apologizing. <laughs> hey, Claire. Um, listen, I, I think this is crunch time right now. Um, I, I read Senator Manchin's editorial. He's asking for additional time. Um, uh, the question is, to what purpose? Uh, if we're going to take an extra month to pass this legislation, um, then we need to be talking about you know, what brings us together as a caucus. Um, I, I share this frustration uh, over an obsession uh, on the top line, right? This, how much are we going to spend um, net of tax revenue we bring in? What we should be focused on is what do we need to do to save middle America, right? What are the economic investments we need to make in people that's going to save this democracy and save families from ruin? I think if we approach the question that way, we'd be able to find common ground amongst the 50 of us. Um, I don't know uh, the details of what Senator Manchin is willing to support, um, but I knew, but I do know, as you do, in the past, he has been amongst the strongest supporters of of the uh, Affordable Care Act, that he has been amongst the strongest supporters of Medicaid because they help the people of, the West, of West Virginia, just like they help the people of Connecticut. So I hope that we sort of stop this obsession over exactly what the number is and we talk about what American families need. If we do that, I think we can come to some common ground pretty quickly. All right, Senator Chris Murphy, thank you. Hey, thanks so much for watching our YouTube channel. You can follow up on today's top stories and breaking news or catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.